Dear Lord Jesus, we come here today and our hearts just want to sing hallelujah. That Lord, there we have a deep love for you, deeper than any feeling or emotion that we ever knew we could experience, but it consumes us. So Lord, I'm going to I'm going to ask today that your Holy Spirit would take our hearts and our minds captive. That, Lord, we want to bask in that light of your love, knowing full-heartedly that you love us and you care for us and that you watch over us. And we say, Holy Spirit of the living God, now come and take uh, my words captive, take our hearts and our minds captive, that we want to press in and hear what it is you have to say so that we can grow stronger in you, so that we can feel a little bit less attached to this world and more attached to the world that is yet to come. That for any of us, Lord, that have brought in burdens or heavy weights today, Lord, would you release them for you say that your yoke is light and we just want to focus on you that you are our eternal God and this place is not our home. Bind the work of the enemy now, Lord, and don't allow him to work in this place right now, but just free us into your presence in Jesus' name. Amen. So we have uh, a lot of our men are away because it's men and our fathers and dads weeks. I don't have a boy that I can take. The closest thing I have to that is Karis, and she won't go to those things with me. So, <laughs> Does anyone here not have a Bible? Okay, Bible man. So we would, uh, you're welcome to use this Bible. If you don't have a Bible, you can keep this Bible. It's really important that you have a Bible. But if you do not have a Bible, this is a gift. So keep your hand up there so that our Bible man can, there you go. Anybody else? If you would turn to uh, Hebrews chapter 11, and I'm just going to read a couple of verses out of Hebrews chapter 11. Faith is the confidence that what we hope for, we will actually be given, will actually happen. It gives us assurance about things we cannot see. Through their faith, the people in the days of old earned a good reputation. By faith, we understand that the entire universe was formed by God's command that we now see did not come from anything that could be seen or that existed prior. By faith, we know that what we hope for will come to pass. By faith, we know that everything that's created, everything that's in this world, everything that we can see, everything that we can't see was built and created by things that didn't exist prior to God creating them. By faith, we know this. There's a story of uh, scientists who invented a very elementary form of life through amino acids, through carbon, through other elements. They, they took these elements and they, they, they put them into a chamber that approached near absolute zero. And then they zapped it with thousands and thousands of low amperage volts. And they ended up with a, with a, a small amoeba-like creature. And so they came to God and they said, look, God, we took the elements of the world and we took these 
the carbon and we reached almost absolute zero. We couldn't get to absolute zero, but we were really close. And then we zapped it with, with thousands of volts of electricity and we created life with all this stuff. And you know what God said? Get your own stuff. Do you get it? Get your own stuff. Yeah, okay. God built the entire universe and everything in it. In First John chapter, uh, in John chapter one, uh, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that was made, and the Word became flesh, and dwelled among us. It's through faith that I have an understanding that God created the entire world and that nothing was created in this world that he didn't create. It's through faith that I know that. Faith is not an emotion. It is an acknowledgement of truth. It's not just a feeling. You know, when you, when you wake up in the morning and you take your first breath of air, that you're cognizant of, when you get into your car and you drive down the road, when you go to work in the morning, are you aware that God built everything that is all around you? That there's no accidents, there's no mistakes, that somehow this God who built everything out of things that were not, he didn't come in some big bang theory out of stuff that already existed, that may be well what happened, but the truth of it is that these elements and the materials never existed before he spoke them into existence. And then that, that same God that created all the things that are, the animals, the people, the sky, the trees, all of those things, that same God came and walked among us. And for a season, he became one of us to experience everything Everything that we know, every emotion, every feeling, he walked among his creation. And yet he did not sin. He didn't fail. Its faith is the acknowledgement of where we come from. Truth. We are the things that are built by God. The word became flesh and dwelled among us. By faith we know that God actually created everything. There's no nook or cranny or dark space or secret place that God doesn't know about. I, I start to get static on the line when I get further than that. There's no dark place. There's no secret place. There's, there's no place that is, that is a blind spot for God. Could you imagine if there was? Could you imagine if you would stumble across that place? If you traveled to some foreign country or went to your backyard and there was that spot where God was not? Could you imagine in your wildest dreams what might happen to you? If God didn't keep his protective hand over you 24-7 all the time, a place that was godless, I can hardly imagine. And in fact, I can't imagine that. You know, when God looks at you, when God looks at Sam, there's nothing about Sam that God doesn't know. Do you believe that? Does that seem impossible? Improbable? Does it seem nuts or crazy? I think it does. I think in our mind, we, we don't get that. No matter, no matter how bad your condition is, no matter how rough it is, there's nothing about the condition that God doesn't know. That takes real faith to believe that. Because sometimes it seems that God's not on the scene. Sometimes it seems that we're trapped in that, in, that, in that little section of godlessness in this world. But we never are. 
God created all things that are out of things that were not. He spoke them into existence. The scripture even tells us that before the foundations of the world were built, he knew you. He knew you and everything about you. He knew exactly what you'd be going through. He knew exactly who you were. He knew how tall you'd be, how short you'd be, how smart you'd be, how dumb you'd be. He knew everything that would happen to you. If he didn't, he can't be God. He built you. There's nothing about you that he doesn't know. There's no dark spot. There's no place of your life where you can go and hide from him, but there's no place that you can go from him and escape his blessing either because he loves you deeply. Faith is not an emotion. It's not just a feeling. You know, I think we've reduced the word to that. Oh, I have faith that things will work out for you. Faith is being sure, absolutely positive, that the things that God promises will come true. That we know absolutely that if God is for you, who can stand against you? That if God is for you, who can stand against you? That's faith. The knowledge, acknowledging truth. Faith is, is, is not an ingredient in your life. I don't suppose that many of us would want to admit this. But some of us come to church because we want to be uh, better people. We want to be nicer people. We know that, that there's, there's things that maybe we've done in the past or, or things we want to change or, or something like that. And we think that if we, come, if we come into contact with church, that somehow we're going to be made a better person for that. You, you, you can't add faith to your life like an ingredient. You know, it's not like a stew or a soup or something that's missing that one ingredient and you add that to it and, and voila, you have a better soup. It's not like salt or something that brings things to flavor. I mean, I think that you can come to church and you can have some good things can happen to you. You know, you, you can make some friends and, and you know, maybe you'll find a husband or a wife or something. I don't know. But some, that's one of the reasons why some people come to church. Some people come to church because it's good for business. You know, some people come to church just to be a nicer person, but that's not what church is all about. Faith is not an emotion. It is an acknowledgement of truth. Faith is not an ingredient. It is a resurrection. In order for you to truly understand what I am saying, in order for you to really get what I'm saying about faith, that faith is not just well-wishing or a good idea, you have to engage God on his terms. He reaches out to you, and you have to reach out to him. What happens to us when we become faithful people, when we say, God, I kind of think I understand that you created all things. I, I, I think I kind of get that. And, and I kind of think that, that, that you knew me before the foundations of the world were built. You, that you somehow, you know, that's a stretch, but wow, I, I kind of get that. And I kind of believe that, that you know me, you know, you, you know, it just seems that you know me. Hey, I don't know, there's things in me that, you, that I don't want you to see, but you see them. And, you know, there really, maybe there are no dark spots, because, you know, even in my roughest times, I mean, it seems that you were there, but, but you know, I, I just... Ah, I'm just not sure about, about how far this, this faith can go. I would like to have a better life. I would like to feel more alive and more empowered. And I would like not to feel like a loser. I'd like to be free from addictions and fear and all that. I'd like to do that. Is it true? that you want to give me a second chance? 
Anyone who believes in his son, who came and dwelled among us, who lived among us and did not sin and, and died for the forgiveness of our sins. Any one of us who says, comes to Jesus and says, you know, Jesus, I know that you know me and I know that you want to give me a second chance. I just have a hard time believing it, but I'm coming to you right now and I'm asking you to come into my life, to forgive me of my sins, and give me a second chance, because I believe you created everything. It's not, it is a mystery to me, but I do believe you created everything. And I believe that faith is not an ingredient. I can't, I can't seem to add you into my life to make things better. That just doesn't work. Instead, I have to be born again. I have to be recreated. You know, God is still in the business of creation. He's still building things. We know that he built cats. We have two kittens in our house, you know, and they wreck everything. But it's great to watch them grow up. They climb the trees and they smash vases. And, and last night when my girls were all out uh, at a movie, uh, they're coming and purring, you know, you know. And you can just see God's creation working in these things. And I guess in a way I'm kind of godlike to them because I feed them, you know, and that makes me popular. <laughs> but, but, I hope I'm not going too far a scale from you. Just, just please bear with me a little bit on this. That God created you. He, he built you. Just like he built those cats. And there's nothing about you that, that, he, that, that he doesn't know. That he's fully aware of all the things that are in you. I mean, do you have some reasonable expectation that that might be true? Because if you do, you're bordering on faith. Do you, do you know that if you really want to know God, if you, if you want to engage him on some level other than just having some superficial knowledge, do you realize that, that you cannot add God to your life as an ingredient? He won't just make, you know, make your, your, your soup better. He won't just make your life better. In fact, in, in one of the group, my, my Romans group, I mean, uh, we're talking about this, and finally I can see the lights coming on. And I said to them, you know, if you really want to know God, you have to be recreated. You have to let God continue his work of building, of creating, because he's still in the business of creating things today. One of the things he creates are Christians. He takes our doubts and our fears and our hostility and our anger towards him. And he says, will you let me give you a new life? I know my plans for you, declares the Lord. They are not to harm you, but to prosper you, to give you hope and a future. Do you believe that? It's if you believe that you're going to need faith. And if you, have, if, you're, if you need faith, then you're going to have to be recreated. You're going to have to be born again. Romans chapter 8, verses 10 to 11. You might want to open your Bibles to this verse. Romans chapter 8, verses 10 to 11. But if Christ is in you, your body is dead because of sin, yet your spirit is alive because of righteousness. And if the spirit of him who raised Christ from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who lives in you. Do you realize that when you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, when you allow faith to breed in your soul, do you realize that the very same Spirit of God that raised Jesus Christ from the dead? Now, you know how the gospel works, right? Jesus Christ died for the forgiveness of your sins. That's fine. That pays for the sin. But Jesus didn't stay dead. He was resurrected. The Spirit of God raised him from the dead. So just as Jesus has a new life, he died for your sins, so you have a new life in him. What he's saying to us now, what Paul is telling us, are you aware that the transaction that occurred when Jesus Christ was raised from the dead by God, by the Holy Spirit, that very same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. Now we're talking a dead Jesus. Dead, cold Jesus. Jesus. Dead, dead, dead. Dead. Dying for your sins. He wasn't a little bit dead. He wasn't mostly dead. He was totally dead. The spirit of the living God came and breathed new life into him. And he rose. 
and his physical body is seated at the right hand of God today. Today. That same spirit, that same, not just power of God, God is living in you. If you have received Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, God has taken up residence in you. Wow, that's going to need some faith to get past that one. God is not an emotion. Faith is not an emotion. Faith is not an ingredient. Faith is an acknowledgement that God created everything, including you. That you're not a mistake. You're not a blip on the radar. You're not an error. You're not dumb or stupid. That he built you. And he is deeply passionate for you. So much so that he sent his one and only son to die on the cross for the forgiveness of your sins. Dead, dead, dead. But that same spirit that came and raised Jesus Christ from death to life now inhabits you if you're a believer. Faith is not an emotion. It's an acknowledgement of truth. It's a fact. The truth will set you free. Guess what? Jesus will set you free if only you choose to believe. Faith is not an ingredient. It's a resurrection. Faith often seems foolish or dumb or inconsequential. Faith makes us look stupid sometimes. 2 Timothy chapter 1, 11 and 12. And of this gospel, of this good news, of this belief, of this faith, of this truth, I was appointed a herald, a horn, a trumpet, a loud noise, and an apostle, and a teacher, a purveyor of knowledge. That is why I am suffering as I am. Yet I am not ashamed, because I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day when he comes to take me home. I am a loud noise. I am a trumpet. Because I have faith. I have knowledge. Because I know that God created all things. And I know that he is particularly fond of you. It is not an emotion. He does not desire you to add him to your life as an ingredient. He would like to recreate you. To build you new and fresh and clean and strong and healthy. For I know the plans for you, declares the Lord. They are not to harm you, but to prosper you, to give you hope in the future. When Sam and I were talking about having to move in faith, we were, conf we were showing our war wounds in the office the other day. And I, re I recall a story from a long time ago in my life that I shared with Sam. And Sam says, that, that story gives you courage to face the next day and to face the next challenge. Years ago, uh, when Lorelai and I were brand new Christians, I used to have an honest job. I, I owned an insurance company. And... I was about to be brought on as a partner, which is a pretty big deal. And so just before the paperwork was about to be signed, the, the, the CEO of the company up and died of cancer within a week. And the next thing you knew, I was without a job. So uh, probably another company came about the company. But, you know, we, we, uh, we, were, we were living our lives boldly for the Lord. Uh, we had a I had men's groups and things that was running out of my office and the company that I was working for. You know, and God just really put it on my heart. He says, Kelly, he says, go and open up your own agency. Go and, go and do this thing. Now, does God speak to you that way? Does he, does he give you that kind of direction? Well, he sure did for me. He said, Kelly, go and open up this agency. And sure enough, you know, I, I looked at all my paperwork and everything. I had everything I needed to do the job. I just didn't have any money. So I, I met this great guy. We became friends, and, and he had a little bit of money, and I went and I got a loan from the 
the Federal Business Development Bank. And when you know, we, we got everything into line up to open up this, this insurance business. And we knew that it was going to be a ministry of God. That was the whole intent to, to, you know, I was president of the Downtown Business Association at the time. And we were winning people to the Lord. We, had, we, we even had lawyers coming. Can you imagine that? You know, of all the things. And, and, and people were coming to the Lord. It was exciting. And, 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 and so I, I applied for my Insurance Corporation of British Columbia license. That's, uh, that's what I would have needed to keep bread and butter on the table. You know, I was a commercial broker at the time, but that's what you need to do that auto insurance that keeps the business coming in. And I, I, bought, I went and I leased the, leased the building. I, uh, I uh, had hired staff. I had applied for the license, and it was, it, was a, it was a green light all the way through, green light, green light, green light. And the day that my office was about to be open, the uh, provincial government decided in a move that they were going to have a moratorium on all ICBC licenses. So there I was. I had an office full of people. I had computers and desks and staff, and I had everything rented, advertising, and no, no auto plan license. Now, maybe that doesn't mean much to you, but I mean, that, that to the rest of the insurance community, I was a total fool. There I was, listening to God, thinking that he was guiding me and directing me to do this really crazy, wild thing to, to open up this business, and then at the very last moment to have the thing crash. And I remember times like, like working on the building myself and having the, the, the competition from the company, uh, from other company, come and look at me. And they stood in my, in my office and actually pointed fingers at me and laughed at me. You are such a fool. 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 And I felt about this small. And scared. Knowing, at least thinking that somehow I was following God in my life. And then to have this happen. So what do we do? Shut her down? 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18 to 21. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, for us, for us who are in the process of being transformed into the image of Christ, for, thus, for us who are, are being recreated, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence I will frustrate. Where is the wise man? Where is the scholar? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? We are faced with circumstances lots of times where things happen to us and we deeply doubt the call of God. That's never happened to you, right? Has it happened to you? Faith is not an emotion. It's an acknowledgement of truth. That God created all things. You included. Your job, your wife, your children. Faith is not an ingredient that you can add to your life to somehow make your life better. Faith is a resurrection. You have to be rebuilt, reconstructed, made new. Faith will almost always seem stupid and dumb to other people, at least for a while. So I opened up my business. Now I'm scared. God says, go and pray over your business. And, you know, it, at some level, I remember praying over it and thinking, does this seem self-serving or... You know, that I would be praying, um, you know, for a, a job. But I had little children, and I had a wife, and they needed an income. And I really believed that I was serving the Lord through the work that I was doing as an entrepreneur. I really believed that. So I did the only thing I knew to do. I, 
went into the office and I stood in the back corner and I said, Jesus, I do believe that you asked me to do this. And so I'm asking for you to make it happen. And I'm asking in your name for this to happen. Amen. Open the business. The people are laughing still. On the third day, on the third day, I got a call from one of the VPs of ICBC. And he said that my story had reached one of the MLAs and that he had felt that I was poorly treated. And so he put his own member's bill before the legislature and they voted one more license. That was mine. Faith is not an emotion. Faith is the, is the acknowledgement that God knows who you are and he cares. Faith is not an ingredient. It's not something you add to your otherwise successful life. <laughs> wow. I mean, for me, it's turned my life inside out and upside down. But in order to appreciate it, in order to, re in order to hold on to it, there has to be a resurrection. There has to, you have to allow God to continue his work of creation. He built fish and planets and trees and you. And he continues to build you. When you receive Jesus Christ as your personal savior, he will continue to build you. He will continue to construct you into the image of Christ. That same spirit that raised a dead Jesus, dead, dead, dead. Do, um, do you understand that Jesus was really dead? Not, not, you know, people say, oh, well, he was God. He was dead. And unless God resurrected him, brought him back to life again, he would have remained dead. But the Holy Spirit came upon the body of Jesus and resurrected him from death to life. That same spirit is alive and living in you, if you're a Christian. Real faith always proves itself through action. James chapter 2, verse 14. Dear brothers and sisters, what's the use of saying you have faith if you don't prove it by your actions? That kind of faith can't save anyone. Faith without deeds, faith without work, is not faith at all. It, it, it doesn't give you any indication that you've been recreated or rebirthed or reborn or reformed. It's not just an emotion or an attitude or an ingredient. It's not just a change your mind kind of thing. Okay, I'm going to have hopeful faith. Faith means that you have been born again, recreated, that the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead is alive and living in you, and that will change the way you live. It will change the things that you do. Faith without works is dead. It's no faith at all. We have a group of men who are actually pretty normal guys. You know, they're accountants, they're computer nerds, they're workers, they're bankers. One of the guys even a pastor. And we were nagged by a certain couple to go to Haiti. And they said to us, do you know that there's orphanages there that need to be built? Because that earthquake has killed hundreds of thousands of people. And that particular, minister, that particular country now is really hurting. It's really a mess. 
And, and it's not, you know, it's not the sort of, a, you know, today's, it's not, it's not the flavor of the day, ministry-wise, anymore. You know, it's been a while since that catastrophe has happened. So now, you know, it's, 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 not, it's not so, quote, sexy. Now the heavy lifting really needs to be done, and, and we, we got to do something about it. But, you know, we got computer nerds and, and accountants. And we got life, we got stuff to do, you know. And until God starts to say, do you realize that I built that place? And I built those people. I know when I'm, I'm listening, in, you know, uh, to a podcast called The Story. And on The Story, they're interviewing, you know, it's a non-Christian guy, but he's interviewing people from Haiti. And you can, you can just say, hear the, you know, well, if only we could get our hospital rebuilt. We know we could take care of it ourselves. But, but there's, there's no cooperation. Everything's kind of falling apart. But, you know, it's not just money we need. We need people to come here and to invest some of themselves in us so that, we can, so that we can get on with our lives again because things have fallen apart. Do you realize I've lost my entire family? I have nothing. And that's what the, 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 you know, that, that's what the Franklins are saying. These people have lost everything. And so accountants and computer nerds and, and all these people have no good reason on earth to go to Haiti. No good reason at all, except for one thing. They've been recreated. And so they're not serving themselves anymore. They go to bed at night, they think about Haiti. They wake up in the morning, they think about Haiti. Why? Because God is calling them to go there to do something immeasurably more than they can imagine because because faith seems pretty foolish. What would God want with a computer nerd in Haiti? Because he's going to be putting shingles on a building praying for some family, giving them some warmth, some practical expression of God's love. Faith is the acknowledgement of truth, that God deeply loves those people in Haiti, that he doesn't want them to perish, that he wants to rescue them just like he wants to rescue us, that, in the, that he will call people who themselves have been resurrected, who themselves have been deeply changed and transformed to be his hands and feet to do the work. Real faith. Like, like not just the stuff, not just the stuff where you are a well wisher. Real, the real stuff always proves itself through actions. And finally, the kind of faith that I've been talking about today, it engages the power of the kingdom of God in your own life. It engages the power of the kingdom of God in your own life. It's transformative. You release the power and authority of that spirit that is living and breathing inside of you to change you. That there's no dark places, there's no place to hide. You sort of give in and you say, God, I know I can't hide from you. I know you know everything about me. Will you please use me to extend your kingdom of God? Uncle, I give up. I want to become a mature Christian. I want to become bodacious. I want to feel the wind in my hair. I want to know what it's like to live boldly and courageously for you, even if I am a computer nerd. Matthew 11, verses 12 to 13. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of God has been forcefully advancing. And forceful men lay hold of it. Since the days of John the Baptist, the last of the Old Testament prophets, the kingdom of God has been forcefully advancing and really Determined, crazy, nutty, whacked out people say, I went in on it. Do you know what that means? Since the days of John the Baptist, the kingdom of God has been forcefully advancing, and really determined individuals say, God, I want more. I want to have the kind of faith that rocks the world. I, I don't. I'm not. I do not want to have to just say that I'm a Christian and have some kind of emotional experience. I want to know that that the reason I'm on the face of this earth has a reason for it. 
I want to know that it's not just an emotion. I want to know that it's not just an ingredient. And even if I look stupid, I'm, I'm going to, you know what? I'm, God, I'm choosing you even if I look like a total bonehead. I want to do what you've called me to do. I want to make a difference. I want, I, 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 I want my life in faith to have action. I want people to see the difference. And finally, I want to be one of those forceful men that lay hold of the kingdom of God. I don't want to be a wimp. Since the days of John the Baptist, the kingdom of God has been forcefully advancing. And forceful men lay hold of it. Dave, do you want to come down?